Um, we'd like to introduce our speaker. His name is uh, Dr. Bullock, and uh, we'll let him tell a little bit more, but we'd like to say a prayer. Um, Sister, what would you mind giving us the opening prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we're able to assemble here together and that we're able to learn um, those things that we need to learn to be able to um, be informative and we might be able to learn how to avoid contagions and, and please help us that, um, that as we are learning these things that we will have our minds and heart open to this information and that um, we'll feel be close to us. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to turn the time over to uh, Dr. Scott Bullock and we'll introduce him. All right. Thank you. So contagion. I honestly, I was a little bit uh, hesitant to want to present this mainly just because we're all so tired of it already. Um, <laughs> but I personally feel that it's somewhat unlikely that what we've just gone through is the last one that we're going to go through. I think that there's a high potential for other types of contagions. And I think that some basic skills in how to how to manage those, how to protect yourself, how to how to interact with people that you're trying to help that that could be contagious um, is is of some value, especially as we're trying to prepare and, and uh, with some basic things, you can you can accomplish a lot in, in kind of keeping yourself safe. Um, I put this picture up here. This is they they always paint them really pretty, and this is a particularly nasty virus. Um, this is actually a, a variant of hepatitis. It has uh, to best best um, estimates are it has about a 70% morbidity rate, meaning about 70% of people that are exposed to it will get it, well, not people, rabbits. This only is for rabbits, thank goodness. So 70% exposed will get it, okay, and, or excuse me, 100% that are exposed will start to show symptoms or close to that, 90% will die. So extremely contagious, very, very easy to, very high, what we call an r naught number, and we're gonna talk about that. So fortunately, this only is for rabbits. It does, people are not affected by it, no other animals we know are affected by it. This has, has tremendously affected the rabbit population in uh, most of Europe, a lot of um, uh, uh, Australia, and is working its way through the U.S. And so, uh, so some of the potential for pretty nasty bugs is out there, and how we deal with them is what we're going to be talking about. Okay, um, goals in this presentation. One of the things that we have seen recently and we really know that that anytime that something significant significant is going on we're going to have a huge influx of information some of it may be accurate and some of it will not be accurate and being able to go through that and determine for yourself what this means because the, the, the higher the risk, the more the emotion, the more the variability. And we all know how it is that, you know, by this, it'll keep you safe. By that, it'll keep you safe. Do this, we'll do, the, you know, and, and all these different directions. And being able to navigate that and see, okay, what's the real information? Where did it come from? And how can I evaluate that? So we're not caught up in all of the marketing, all of the politics, all of the other stuff that comes into play as we're just trying to find out what we need to need to do to protect ourselves. So that's going to be the first part of it. And then the second part is, okay, we have something that is, that is at least concerning to us. What do I do about it? 
how do I keep myself safe and, and my family? So we're gonna, those, that's the two parts that we're gonna be discussing. So, first of all, in research, disclosure of bias is important. So I'm gonna go through that. First of all, so my background and my bias. My background for this is I'm trained as an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Um, I work in the mouth. I, I in a, a cr situation creating aerosol. Uh, because of that, it's a high risk area. Um, part of my training is, of course, dealing with that. We have to recertify every single year in management of, of pathogens. Uh, we have to be careful that we don't catch something from the patient, we don't transmit something from the patient, we don't transmit something from one patient to another patient. And so all of those are something we have to do, we have to do continuing education and we have to recertify in every year. Also, part of my background is I've been doing research for about 30 years, uh, starting in in dental school with uh, study doing, looking at different kinds of toothpaste and kids and how they, you know, what will make them use it more to there were studies about uh, cheddar cheese being helpful in decreasing cavities if you eat it before you go to bed. I mean, just there really weird stuff. Some of it's kind of interesting. Um, I was I was involved with the uh, early on studies of propofol, if anybody's uh, uh, if you've ever had a colonoscopy or wisdom teeth out or anything where it's a quick anesthetic, uh, we did the, the, uh, some of the initial studies for propofol. Um, I, I've been the primary investigator for uh, six or seven uh, um, FDA drug studies um, and as well as uh, bench research uh, projects, many of which have been published, and you know, so, so, and currently, I'm I'm a reviewer for the the top rated um, journal in implant dentistry in the world. It's the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants. What they do is that I'm one of their reviewers, which means they send me the new research, and I have to go through it and and look at. What are the problems with it? What did they miss? Did they, you know, they checked all the boxes? Is it relevant? You know, is it well done? Is it understandable? And then make recommendations on how to to improve it before it goes to to publication. So, so research is a fairly um, I'm fairly familiar with that. Obviously, I did not choose to be a, a full time researcher. Research is fun to think about and fun to kind of learn things but it's not fun to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so I've gained a great appreciation for those who do spend their lives doing that. It's tedious, it's difficult, uh, but you know, research is, that's, that's where we learn from. And so it's, it's, it's important. Anyway, so that's my background. Bias, as far as this, so basically, my biases are, I believe that there, that there are significant uh, serious pathogens that do exist out there. Um, and I think that many of them could become contagious, whether they do that by natural means or whether that is a man-made occurrence, who knows, I think both are possible. Um, I believe that here, the clear and accurate assessment of the contagion can take time and early estimates and information will likely be inaccurate. We saw that to a great degree. All of the information coming from all different directions, okay? Uh, and, and how do we assess it for ourselves? Um, I think reliable information is critical. Okay, especially in something really serious. We're not talking, if we're not talking about something that is just gonna make you a little sick, we're talking about something that is likely going to kill you or leave you with significant disabilities, uh, you wanna be able to determine that uh, as, as much as possible for yourself. There's good and bad research. There's research that is very well done and research that is very poorly done. Uh, there's also good research that is very misrepresented. Very, very common. We see uh, extrapolation, and so extrapolation. Uh, just in, 
I'm going to go through some examples because I realize if we get into this, for most people, it's going to be just a bunch of words on a slide. And so I'm going to try to, to, to make it uh, a little bit easier to grasp. Ex extrapolation, where you take actual results, but then you extrapolate it in, you change it into something, means something bigger than that. And it's very difficult to not do that, especially when you have biases involved in that. And so you really have to be able to look at a research paper and see what did this actually show versus what are they saying that it could possibly show. Uh, sensationalizing, where something, that's, that's kind of the, I think of the, the, the tabloids, you know, the um, uh, wolf boy found in Africa or something like that. And then you, you look at it and, okay, he has a medical condition where he grows hair all over his body. He really has no genetic connection to a wolf. Okay, that's, that's sensationalizing, taking real information potentially and presenting it in a way that is eye-catching or may convince people or steer people in a certain direction but isn't really accurate. And downright fraud. And that's, that's unfortunately very common. Um, i give an example of that. About 20 years ago, and this is so a, a, a product that I won't name, but, and I don't think it's even on the market. I honestly don't think it's even available anymore. But about 20, well, it's probably more than that. I'm dating myself. It's probably been closer to 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, I was a, an oral surgery resident, and a, a member of our ward said, hey, you got to buy this stuff. You know, I know you're in medicine and this, this will do this and this and this and this and this. A whole big long list of stuff that this, this material would, would cure. And so I said, oh, that's interesting because, I mean, that's, that's impressive. I said, is there any research on this? Oh, absolutely. And he pulled out a full page of research articles. And so it was over 50 or about, anyway, over 50. And... So I took that and I was on call. And there it was in-house call, which means I've got to be in the hospital regardless of whether there's anybody in the emergency room or not. So um, since I was at the university, I had access to all research. It's already paid for, we can just download it and, and there it is. So I spent several hours going through 50 different, um, different uh, presentations validating this, this product. And what I found was that of the 50, only five were actual research that involving, well, I shouldn't even say actual research, involved that product at all. The other 45 plus only mentioned it as a comparison. Okay, so not valid. They, they don't validate this material, they only mention it. The five that were done, all five of those were done by the company with no oversight and no statistical analysis. Okay, that's fraud, pure and simple fraud. Okay, so that does exist. And so you need, but for somebody looking at that paper would say, wow, they've done a lot of research. Here it is, 50 of them. Okay, none of that was actually valid. So you need to know how to look deeper. Now, you may not be in a university and be able to have access to that, but they do at the library. Typically, you can go to the library and sit down and they generally have paid subscriptions to all of it and you can usually bring up these, these uh, research papers and actually see what's in them. So, we're going to be talking about that a little bit. Okay, next one. Okay, a lot of words on a, on a slide. Sorry about that, but I'm going to try to hopefully make it, make it meaningful for you. First of all, what kind of study is it? As you've got this article, what, what kind is it? Is it a scientific paper? And we'll get into that, what that means. Is it an opinion paper? Opinion papers can be great. They can pull in a lot of information from other scientific papers. You can then go back through and look, but you've got to do that extra step. Otherwise, all it is is, is an opinion. Okay? We all have bias. If we have an opinion, we have bias. That's the reality of it. We have to recognize it in ourselves and we have to recognize it in those that are presenting information. That's why I'm trying to go through that because you know, I want you to see what my bias is as we go through this. 
And as you're reading through, through papers, you need to be able to see what the bias is of this opinion paper. Okay. Anecdotal information. Anecdotal information is, I know somebody who did, they, they, this happened and they took this and they, you know, it's, 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 it's individual experiences, individual examples, okay? No math, no actual study done, okay? And, and that is not, not admissible at all in a scientific paper, okay? Um, because you can find anecdotal evidence for anything. No matter what opinion you have of anything, you can find anecdotal information to, to back that up. And so that's not considered science. Now, one of the strongest tools we have in scientific research is meta-analysis. What a meta-analysis is, is they take a whole bunch of research papers, often thousands, it can be a really big process, but they take many, many, many papers and they, they, they whittle it down to however many papers have, have covered the same information in a close enough way that they, that they can back each other up or refute each other. Because some papers will have some results and others will have others. And so this is not just looking at one result, this is looking at hundreds or possibly even thousands of results all put down and, and then statistically going through those and mathematically looking at what what are the what's the potential that this is actually reliable information and that's where you really get the the, the highest level of reliability is when you have a, a meta-analysis okay. another really good thing to look for is is this paper referee or not refereed means somebody is reading it that's what i do I would be considered a referee for that. Uh, that is somebody reading this that has no dog in the fight. I have nothing to gain from it. I have nothing to lose from it. Okay, my job doesn't depend on it. I don't get paid for it anyway. It's voluntary. And but does and, and I'm evaluating this based on its merit. I don't even know who wrote it. I don't know what country it came from. I only know what's on the paper and I evaluate it and, and you know, information back. So in all of your really serious journals are going to be refereed. Okay. The, the referee, well, in research, the ones that aren't refereed are considered trash journals. That's what we call them. Because, not that it's all bad, but usually those are primarily interested in marketing. It's the ads that are in the, man, in the, the journal that they're primarily interested in, not the, not the research. They'll, they'll publish anything from anybody. And so the fact that it's in a journal, you want to look at what kind of journal and where did the information come from. Okay, study designs. Now, let me just give you a, a so is it overseen? Is, is it sponsored? So let me give you an, an example there that will kind of bring this in. One of the most difficult to work with is anything dealing with FDA. Tremendously rigorous. Um, so, uh, so I was hired not by either the FDA or by the, the pharmaceutical companies to be a, pri a, a primary investigator. So how that works, it is sponsored, meaning this is a drug company that is sponsoring this research. That's a red flag, okay? We're always a little bit concerned if the one doing the research, okay, is sponsoring the research. So it is sponsored, however, they're not doing the research. The first step is they have to, they write up their protocol and it has to go through the IRB, the Investigational Review Board. They have to go through it and they're, they're, they're independent. They have to go through it and determine that this is a good study and it's a safe study to do. Okay, for people or animals. Um, one of the studies that I did that was not a drug study, I was using cow bone in order to measure the temperature increase in bone when you're drilling to do implants. And I was using cow femurs that I got, that, um, I got from the local grocery store. Even with that, I still, in order to publish it, I had to to tell them exactly where it came from and not only where the bones came from, 
but what the whole process with the cow in order to get the bones to the grocery store. Okay, so IRBs are very strict as far for knowing what is happening, whether you're it, this is an animal study or a people study. Okay, so with the with the drug studies, they're sponsoring it. They hire a separate company that is independent. Uh, they get paid the same regardless of the of the results, and then they then hire me as a primary investigator. So I'm two levels away from the sponsor. I didn't really ever meet with the sponsor other than just at the beginning and I'm saying, okay, this is the protocol you've got to follow. Then it is overseen by a representative of the FDA who comes in and they make sure that everything is absolutely done perfectly and it is a pain in that. Now blinded means that the, the subject, the patient in these cases, does not know what they're getting. Double blinded means the one that is giving it to them doesn't know what they're getting either. Okay, and then it's evaluated by somebody, and the information that puts them together is kept in a safe, and one person has that. And so, extremely rigorous protocol to go through in order to accomplish one of these one of these studies. So, yes, it's sponsored, but it's also overseen. If you look at a study and it's sponsored or it's selling something, but it has no, it's not overseen nor is it, is it blinded, then the validity of that becomes more concerning. It doesn't mean that there isn't validity, it just means it becomes more concerning because there's more potential for bias in that case. Okay? If somebody's trying to sell something, obviously, the, the, in this case, the drug company really wants to sell it. Now, just to give you an idea, when we, I, you said it. You did, you, I did either six or six or seven of these specifically with the drug companies with FDA. Of those, only two of the products ever made it to market. The others didn't, and and most and at least two of them were were because of results that we were getting as with with my part of the study. One of them, we had one patient that had a reaction that was very concerning. No damage, he was fine, but he had to spend the night in the hospital. That, that enough, and this is, this is in the final stages, that, that pharmaceutical company had already spent untold millions to get it there. This was a, a, a brand new COX-2 inhibitor that uh, would be a, so the COX-2 inhibitor that came after this one was Celebrex, which is a billion dollar, uh, billion dollar medication. So we had one patient with a serious problem. They both, the, the FDA and the, the pharmaceutical company looked at it, scrapped the whole, the whole thing. They, that they ended it right there. So very, very, very grueling process. But the, what I'm bringing up with this is, is it sponsored? Is it overseen? Is it blinded? All of those are to try to decrease the, the bias. Uh, sponsored increases the bias. Okay, so the design of a scientific study, and there are slight variations to this, but the basic information has to be there. So they may have slightly different names, but if you're reading through a, a scientific paper, all of these parts need to be there, and each one has its purpose. The abstract is just a short little blurb that tells you a little bit about it. And if you're looking it up on the internet and you don't have access to the paper, that's all you're gonna get in most cases, it's just the abstract. The purpose, this is typically your, your uh, the, the review of the literature. What has already been done in this subject? What are the other studies that they're building this study off of? And then you have methods and materials. That's how it was done. When you write your methods and materials, you're supposed to make it specific enough so that anybody else that wants to do it can, can duplicate your work to see if they get the same information. That's where meta-analysis uh, meta comes from, is from people saying, I'm going to do this again, and, and over and over, and you get multiple results, um, or at least the same, the same or similar. There's got to be a statistical analysis. Now, the language is different. The word significant is a mathematical term, okay? That we say, oh yeah, that was really significant. No, it wasn't. How do you know that unless you do the math, okay? 
it's a it, it's a term we throw around, but in its actual use, it's a mathematical term. And so if there is no statistical analysis, they didn't actually do a comparison, okay? For example, if you do, so you do a study with 10 people and six have one outcome and four have the other, then, oh yeah, most of the time it turns out this way. You can't really say that because you only did 10 people, okay? For depending on the design, you may need 100 people, you need, may need 1,000 people in order to gain statistical significance. And so, so that's why that's got to be there. If that's not there, there's something really wrong with that, with that paper, if they're comparing two potential outcomes or more. The discussion, this is the play area, okay? The discussion is where the, 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 the author is free to extrapolate a little bit, okay? You can say, these are my results. This was significant, but it was edging towards, or this wasn't significant, but it was edging toward maybe it might become significant if I did more of these, okay? Or you can say, well, th this is my, re these are my results. But this could mean that this also could also happen. So within the discussion, you can do that. Then when you get to the conclusion, all of that is gone. Not a word. It's got to be back to exactly what were the results. Okay. So think about it. If you're going, if you're going through scientific papers looking for a specific thing that you want to promote, okay, your bias is I want to find papers that show this. Where are you going to look? You're going to look in the discussion. And when you present it, you don't present it as this was an extrapolation by the author. You say, this is what the author of this paper said. Okay. Can you see where that's, that's very different than the conclusion? So as you're looking at these papers, you can read through the, 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 the discussion is kind of fun, but the conclusion is where the meat of the, the responses are. Okay. So all in proper language, like you said, statistical, you know, the, the, the actual math, things like that. Uh, Non-scientific, okay, first-hand, second-hand, are you getting your information from here or there or wherever? I always want to say, who is they? They say that this, who the heck is they? Okay, you got to know who they is. Um, if you want to know what's happening here, check with places here. If you want to know what's happening at the hospital here, Go to the hospital here. If you want to know what, what is, is happening in the community here from a medical standpoint, go to the health department and talk to the people that are actually there that are actually watching the, the numbers. So know where the information is coming from. The whole, all of this comes back to say, look for and recognize the bias. Bias is in everything, no matter what it is. Uh, you know, if, if you have an opinion, you have a bias. And so know what that is in yourself so that you're not overlooking material that could be really important to you and know what and know how to recognize it in other sources. Okay, so that's all of that. Now we're gonna get into the actual kind of the, the, the contagion part of it itself. So types of contagions, the main ones, viruses, bacteria, fungi, worms, protozoa, the ones we're gonna talk about mostly and my pointer just died, so I'll have to, we'll, we'll go old school and all. So, so the, we're going to talk about the first two because really, if you're looking at something that's going to be really significant, it's going to be in the first two, either viruses or bacteria. Viruses, to give you an idea, 1 times 10 to the 31st, that's a 1 with 31 zeros behind it. That's the closest estimate, or whatever that means, um, of how many viruses are in our biosphere? Not how many different viruses, but how many total, okay? Well, so a, a, a million is 10 to the six, a billion is 10 to the ninth. So there are what, about seven times 10 to the ninth people on the planet. And there are, you know, 10 to the 31 viruses around us. So they are everywhere. When you figure everything else, the bacteria, the fungi, the worms, the protozoa, all of the single cell organisms of any kind make up about four times 10 to the 30. So there are more viruses floating around out there 
than just about every other every other cell we say living thing except viruses we don't really call them living we don't even know how to classify them other than calling them viruses uh, everything else put together okay so the numbers are, are incredible all right so we're going to talk about viruses and a little bit about bacteria mm -hmm. uh don't know the numbers with that so yeah so those yeah and and there's some of the i didn't put up all the parasites i mean there there are definitely other ones but basically with there's so all of them put together all other organisms that you can catch something from make up a smaller number than just the viruses by themselves so i just put up the main ones because they could go on and on and on and you know so okay next slide all right so evaluating the situation first of all how bad is this bug that's the first thing we want to know okay china just had an outbreak it seems to always start in china a lot of people close close situations who knows politics all this kind of stuff who knows what's going on in china but they get a lot of stuff that starts in china okay so something starting in china what does it really mean what how do we evaluate what this disease can do so virulence is the ability of this particular organism or virus that cause some disease or damage. So, so what's the likelihood of it doing you damage? Okay, there are a lot of viruses out there that have no virulence at all to us, but they may be really, really dangerous to a rabbit or a chicken or, you know, or whatever. Okay, um, the, one of the biggest issues, how does it travel? Viruses and bacteria. Some there are a few bacteria that have that, that have flagella that can actually move a little bit through fluid, but for the most part, they have no transport system of their own. They have to be carried somewhere in some way, and so, so part of the virulence are the is the characteristics or the characteristics of that individual organism or or pathogen, but how it travels will determine a lot of, of what it actually means to us in a practical sense, okay? How it gets to us, okay? Next, how long can it survive under different conditions? Okay, we always talk about HIV versus, versus hepatitis, okay? Here you have two blood-borne viruses. Uh, hepatitis is, is the, the blood-borne virus that all other viruses are compared to. Uh, HIV, everybody's afraid, you know, less so now, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real bad bug as far as what it can cause, but it's actually a really weak bug, okay? To give you some examples, there, these are both bloodborne, okay? Uh, how long it can survive, uh, hepatitis can survive for months on a surface. It can, it can survive temperatures that we can't even come close to surviving, okay? Uh, HIV, a few days. Anything, any, any extreme temperatures or conditions will kill HIV, okay? Um, uh, dose of exposure to cause the effect. How much, how many of these viruses are you going to need, or is it gonna take to actually give you the disease on an average basis? Obviously that varies on a lot of different things, but it gives us kind of, it gives us a comparison. So for, for example, this is, this is a way that it was uh, described to me, and obviously it's not down to real numbers, but it's conceptual. Okay, if you were to take one cc, okay, cubic centimeter of HIV-infected blood, and you injected that into an eight-ounce glass of water, mix it around, draw up one cc, and inject it into yourself. First of all, you're pretty stupid, but if you were to do that, you may get HIV, but there's a good chance that you would not. If you were to take that one cc and squirt it into an average size backyard swimming pool and let it mix around a little bit and draw up one cc of that swimming pool, swimming pool water, of course, without all chlorine and stuff, and you inject it into yourself, you would very likely get help. Hepatitis is a very, very contagious bug. That's why I say we have a variant dealing with rabbits. Nearly 100% uh, 
more uh, morbidity rate, meaning they're they're almost all get sick, 90% kill rate. So hepatitis is a bad bug. Fortunately, hepatitis for us, there's there's three main types. There are other subgroups. A we can get from food. It's not nearly as bad. B and C are bloodborne. So unless you're dealing with bloodborne situations, you're not going to get you're not going to get hepatitis. Okay. So fortunately, it's very limited in how it travels. So a really nasty virus with very limited travel capacity. Okay. So that's that that becomes really important. Okay. Uh, the severity of the damage, obviously, that becomes really important. Also, the latency period. Latency period. Sorry, no, no. <laughs> you catch it from this bottom corner too, right down there. Just to keep it there. Okay. okay. So the the latency period is how long it takes to be um, to to be transmitted, and. A short latency period is usually better. Uh, Ebola is really nasty, but it has a very short latency period, which means that if you catch it, you generally die quickly, which means that they're able to, to, to isolate it much better than if you have something that has a two or three week latency period and you can spread it all over and not even know that you have it. And so latency period is definitely a point that you want to pay a lot of attention to as you're listening to information about what is this is this virus or what is this this contagion doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. From a latency period, I've heard somewhere that there is if it leaves the person alive longer, it can reproduce more simply. Yes. If they the virus. Yes, it, to, to reproduce more virus and pass that on. Or even human. Uh, yes, yeah, that too. Yep. It, any way that, it, however, it travels, the more time it has to do that traveling, the more effective it's going to be as a, as a pathogen in, in spreading. Doesn't mean it's going to be more effective as a pathogen for that person that has it, but, but for being able to, to disseminate itself is going to increase based on its latency period. Okay, R0. We're going to talk about R0. Uh, what happened to my. Oh, it disappeared somehow. Okay, well, we're going to talk about R0 and my slide. Uh, It'll probably show up later on in the in the, the presentation. Okay, what R not is is how many times on average this contagion will replicate. Will how many times it reproduces its numbers. In other words, if I have it, how many people am I likely to give it to? Okay, an R not of one is me. I'll, I'll give, well, R0 of zero is just me. I get it and I don't give it to anybody, okay? An R0 of one is I get it, but I'll probably give it to one other person, okay? R0 of two is I'm probably gonna give it to two people and on up from there, okay? Now, where R0 gets a lot of bad rap is that the numbers are all over the place, okay? For example, so, so COVID. COVID had an R R naught typically of about 2.4 to 2.7 is what they were looking at in most areas, but some showed it as high as 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 seven. Um, the flu is yeah, about 1.5 up to two. Now, and then you have something like measles. Measles can be truly airborne. Measles has an R naught ranging, depending on the study, from five to 225. Now, so the, the, the tendency is to look at all these numbers and say, it's meaningless, they're jumping all over. You said here, they said it was 2.4, and there they said it was 8.5, okay? But the way, but R0 is a mathematical formula. So it's accurate. It's the application of it that changes. So I would liken it a lot to temperature. If we have a thermometer that's accurate, it's going to tell us that it's 98 degrees right here in this room right now, okay, or whatever, okay. And we may argue that some will say no, it's 104, and some will say it's but but the the thermometer that we've checked and it's actually calibrated says it's 98 degrees, okay. But that doesn't mean it's 98 degrees out there. It's 105 out there, and it doesn't mean that it's that in Nebraska or it's that in you know in Antarctica, okay. We're used to that. If we said, 
temperature is useless because it's always different. Well, yes, but it's a comparison. Okay, and there are different factors that we know to read into that. So, for example, the R0 of the exact same pathogen would be very different in Diamond Valley than it would be in the slums of Shanghai. Okay, you get a whole bunch of people under very dirty circumstances, close, no health care, no, no, very minimal uh, uh, personal hygiene, and you know, many different places. You, you, there are not for the same bug is going to be very different. But that doesn't make it useless. It just means you have to look into what's behind the number. The number's accurate. It's the application that goes behind it. Okay. So if you're looking at a high R0 number, this is a very contagious bug. This is something that, that you're going to, your precautions are going to have. If, if you believe it's real, you know, and you've gone through what this, the, the steps to decide for yourself, is this a real thing or not? And you say, yeah, this looks pretty real. I'd rather err on the side of being careful. What is, is this like the flu? Is this like, you know, Ebola? Is this like measles? How is this gonna move? And so that R not number is actually, I keep pointing up here, it's not there. But that R, that R not number, is very is really very useful but you you can't just take it in and of itself okay all right so levels of protection we're so the most successful is just don't get anywhere around it okay full quarantine we all know how fun that is and how difficult it is and sometimes you just can't do it sometimes you have to get out into the world and you're going to put yourself at risk and so you have to so but as far as reliability the most reliable way to protect yourself is through quarantine. Second is through barrier. Okay, something in between you and that pathogen that is hopefully reliable enough to, to protect you. And there, you, there, there are several things we're going to kind of go through that on how you're going to evaluate that for yourself. Uh, generally, in the medical world, we talk about hand, eye, and lung protection. Uh, you'll see it's actually there's there's a bit more than that, but those are the that's the triad of what what we really consider barrier technique Okay, and then as a last resort is sanitizing you're contaminated Now how do you decontaminate and how are you going to sanitize in order to to not carry that home or or infect yourself? Okay, so we're gonna go a little bit through those. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, Surface, surface, surface and airborne. Those are the, those, is, it, is it in the air? Is it on, on a surface? Those are our big transfer points. Bloodborne is there, uh, body fluids, other body fluids, we all know about those. You know, stay away from the situations that cause those and you're generally pretty safe. We all have to breathe and we all are pretty bad at touching stuff. And so, so surface contamination, we're going to talk about a little bit. So this shows an operating room situation. We, this is, we live and breathe surface, you know, managing surface, uh, surface contamination. And how it's done, oh, back up, we're flipping through. Okay, so as I said before, we have to be careful not to infect ourselves, not to infect patients, not to infect from patient to patient. And so every, every process that we go through is a, it's a, a very highly memorized, choreographed, almost like a dance routine. It's everything's got to be the same way every time. And everybody in that room is watching everything you do. Okay. You, you reach up, scratch your nose. You're, done you take everything down you start over again you know you, you you can't reach up and adjust the light you've got every what you can touch and what you can't hands have to be above your waist you drop your hands you're back out to the scrub room okay every so so it's it is it's like you 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 wash your hands your hands have to be higher than your elbows because everything has to drain down so you scrub down to your elbows then you start again, you scrub your hands. Now, assuming you're using soap and water, you can use other things and we'll get into that. So soap and water, then you go into the OR. You have to back in because you can't touch anything. 
you back in, a nurse hands you your gown, you, you, you put it on, you can't touch anything with your hands, you have to kind of manipulate it this way. You have a card, you hand her the, the, the card that hooks onto your little tie, you do a nice little Michael Jackson twist, you take the other side, you tie it, and you, then you put your, you know, your, your uh, so after that, you've got your gloves, you then start to drape, you know, so there's the whole idea is there's a whole process and it has to be exact because you cannot touch anything that is potentially contaminated. And so really the whole idea of cross contamination is that you've got everything you're doing, you have to plan ahead. And we'll go through that a little bit more. Now, everything in here has a purpose. They have gowns because you don't want to carry this stuff home on your, in, on your clothes. They're wearing caps because you don't want it in your hair. Hair carries a ton of nasty stuff. I mean, how often do you get a, a hair in your food and you say, oh, that's really nice. You know, I'm sure it's clean. They, I'm sure they washed their hair sometime in the last week. And it's like, uh, I'm not eating that, okay? Hair is, a, is tremendously um, efficient at carrying all kinds of nasty stuff. Okay, masks, glasses. So again, the, the, the hands with the gloves, hands high, um, and uh, low. So very memorized processes. Everything has its purpose. Some of these are to protect the patient, some are to protect us, some do both. Okay, we'll go through some of that. All right, next. So if we take that idea and now we go into real life, okay? How many people have touched this before you did? How many people have touched that handle before you did? Okay, and what are they carrying? And has anybody come along and sanitized it? So, okay, let's go through the steps. What's the most successful, I shouldn't say successful because it doesn't, we can't really do it, but the most effective way of protecting yourself is quarantine. Just don't ever do it. Just don't, don't go to the pump. Don't open that door. The problem is that's, we, you know, we want to live and we, we're going to have to touch stuff. And so we typically, quarantine doesn't usually work. Barrier is the next if you have gloves or even a paper towel, okay? So to give you, so for example, pumping your gas, grab a paper towel and use that. That's a barrier. If it's dry, if it's wet, it's not, okay? Because, if, because most viruses can travel through anything that's wet. So, but, and still you may want to sanitize, but the idea is if you can use barriers, for that situation, that's gonna be more effective than sanitizing, okay? Sanitizing should be your last step, okay? I contaminated myself. The really big problem here is cross-contamination that continues, okay? I just, I, I just touched that, and somebody with some real nasty bug just touched it before me, and I put it back, and then I grab my phone, because I've got, you know, I've got a, a text or something. I stick it back in my pocket and I walk over and I open the door and I sit down and I grab my hand sanitizer at that point and I put it on. I sanitize it. I am safe because I just hand sanitized. Well, you know what? Your phone is contaminated. Your car door is contaminated. Your steering wheel is probably contaminated. And, you know, everything else in that whole process. And so you've got to think about the chain of transmission is really the key and it's really difficult and you so so it's the, there, there's a process to go to with it okay so just to give you an idea this is one this is actually a, a study that was redone by Wayne Provost uh, here at Dixie State and and they just like we talked about they took a previously done study and they replicated many of the parts of it to, you know, they reproduced it to see if they would get the same results. And it's pretty interesting what they saw. So what they were looking at was the, uh, the airlines. So they looked at TSA bins, armrests, seat belts, and tray tables on the plane. And they swabbed them and then measured how many uh, colony forming units. That means so if they put this on a petri dish and let it grow and you go back and look at it how many nice little colonies how many villages of bacteria or whatever are going to pop up in this case they were looking for bacteria okay so what they found is a lot of e coli Bacilla. why the a dropped down there 
uh, actinobacter. These are all, this, this is from feces, okay? These are poop bugs, so these, and, and in high numbers, okay? So not really what you want to be picking up from everybody. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is what they found. Everybody, it's just, it's, it's a given, if you're gonna do this kind of study, you're gonna compare to toilet seats, okay? So the toilet seats had 32 colony forming units, okay? You look up there, TSA bins, so the bin that you touch and you put your stuff in and you take out, had 616 average of 616 colony forming units on every on each of those bins. Okay, remember that the next time you go flying. <laughs> it's a, yes, we don't want to think about it too much. Again, it's up to you whether this means anything or not. Okay, and a lot of it's going to depend on. Okay, is this going to make maybe give me the you know some stomach flu or a little bit of stomach upset or is this going to kill me? Okay, so our, our attention changes depending on how threatening it is. All right, seatbelt buckle, 589. Tray tables, 1,688. So the next time you get sleepy and you put that down, you lay your head on it, you know, just remember. <laughs> exactly. The airport toilets were 32. The tray tables were 1,688 colony forming units. So you don't need toilet. Exactly, it's cleaner. So it, you know, we are touching stuff all the time. That's part of life. It's why we have an immune system. You know, we 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 don't want to live in a bubble. We may or may not want to take the step of taking, you know, a, a sanitizing wipe and maybe decreasing this down a fair amount, you know, but, and we may not, we may not care. That's an individual thing. But again, the more serious the bug gets, the more our attention is going to be uh, on that. Okay, so the process. First of all, realize it's going to happen and think about it ahead of time, okay? So I'm going to put gas in my in my car. I forgot to bring gloves. Okay. I've got some hand sanitizer. How am I going to do this? So you think, okay, um, there's some really nasty bugs out there. I really don't want to get it. Well, what do I have around me? Okay, they've got a paper towel here. Maybe I've got something in my trunk similar to that, you know, that you can create a barrier. Okay, that's great. Keep the barrier in one hand. Use your other hand that is always kept clean. Okay. If you, if you have nothing like that, just you, all right? One hand is clean, one hand is dirty. Okay. So I'm gonna take my credit card out of my pocket, out of my wallet, okay? I get contaminated, I'll open my wallet, pull out my credit cards, you know, you're, you're cross-contaminating everything. So I take the credit card out, that's in my clean hand, okay? I go over and you think about, okay, now what do I need to do? I've got to touch that and it may be dirty. My car, I'm going to touch this button and open everything with my car with either before I touch anything or with the side that's clean. I'm going to use the dirty hand to touch the dirty stuff, to push, push the dirty buttons. I'm going to carefully put this in the clean hand, take it out, okay? Keep in mind of what is clean and what is dirty. When you're finished, I'm going to open the car door with this hand, okay? I'm gonna push down the hand sanitizer with this hand, and then I'm gonna, you know, it's still not perfect, but it's better than, darn, what I, I'm stuck, what do I do? You go through the same process, it's a choreographed routine. If it's really important to you, then you spend the time. If it's not really important to you, we don't wanna do all this, we don't wanna worry about it, we don't wanna think about it, okay? I don't do that all the time now. But there were times, or there potentially can be times, where we may really want to be very careful about what we're touching. And if that's the case, if you have determined for you, I do not want to touch that, how do you figure out how not to do it? Okay. Always have always have a backup plan. Right Going back, go slow. You cannot do this in a hurry. Okay. I'm sorry if somebody's waiting and pump behind, you're gonna to have to sit there and think, okay. What's my next step? Until it gets into routine. And then it's just like putting the gloves on and getting them out and spinning them over. Is it 
Yeah. Yes. They're not sterile, but they're probably not contaminated because they're created in a, you know, it's, that's, that's a pretty safe direction to, to go. Again, you're looking for a barrier. Barriers are going to be more effective than sanitizing. And so if you're picking your choice, the most reliable is just don't ever go in there. Second is find a barrier. And third, last resort is, is hand sanitize. So exactly, you think out the process, go slowly, do it carefully. And then you get it down to a routine, and then it just becomes kind of a, a, a normal thing. And then the bug goes away, and you don't have to do it anymore. But, but the, and always have a backup plan, okay? You're there at the grocery store, and you just think, I just touched all that stuff. And now I've got to reach into my pocket or into my purse, and I've got to dig out my credit card because I've got to put it into this, okay? It's, at that point, you've got to have a backup. And maybe that backup is you go to somebody and say, I'm going into the restroom, I'm going to wash my hands or something so that you can start the process over so that you are you're, you have a clean start. So have, if it's really serious, have a backup. Okay, next. Okay, uh, this is an illustration. So we're going to talk about PPE, personal protection equipment. Know your equipment. So. I decided I wanted to start rock climbing. And so I went and looked at ropes. And this rope is really expensive. It's like $200 for that rope. And it'll hold several thousand pounds. It's heavy, it takes up my whole equipment back, backpack. It's a pain in the neck, it always gets wound up. It's just, this, that costs $10, okay? Well, this holds thousands of pounds. This holds 550 pounds. I only weigh 155 pounds, okay? This should be perfectly fine. I should be completely safe hanging off of that, okay? And so here I'm all tied up. I've got my correct knots. You know, my climbing knots are all correctly done and I'm ready to go climb, okay? Well, it said on the package, in fact, I even verified it with the, with the, the salesman that this will hold 550 pounds. Obviously, anybody thinking about this is saying the idiot's going to kill himself, okay? He's going to die because that's not going to hold me on that wall under those circumstances, okay? What is it talking about? It's not talking about going up and through a loop. It's not talking about rubbing. It's not talking about the impact when I fall and it has to catch me, okay? I climb with this, I slip, I'm going to die. I climb with this, it catches me, and it does its job. Okay, so you can't just look at, oh, it says on the package that this is okay for this. You've got to know what are the conditions that this is actually going to perform that for. And the same is the case with your personal protection equipment, with, you know, your, the, the hand, eye, and lung protection and everything else. You've got to know really what does it do and what doesn't it, because the conditions are not the same. All right, so enough of the... The, the silly example, but at least you, you, you see kind of what I'm talking about. And the more life-threatening, the more you want to make sure that you have that rope that holds thousands of pounds rather than the one that holds 550. Okay. All right. So creating a barrier, hand, eye, lung protection, covering your hair, covering your clothes, covering your skin. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. We'll go through some more. Donning and doffing. That's putting it on and taking it off. The highest rate of cross-contamination in, in, among healthcare professionals is in taking the, the, the protective coverings off. And so how you do that, again, has to be, you have to know how, you have to think about it. You have to know what you're doing. So we're gonna go through that a little bit. Now, most, most things are one use only. So they're disposable. And so you don't really have to worry about reuse or decontamination unless you really need it, okay? How many of the, the right kind of masks? How many gowns? How many things were available when COVID first hit, okay? Many of those things you couldn't get. Doesn't matter how much you're willing to pay for them, you cannot get them. And so you may have to, whatever you do have, you've got to reuse it. And so you've got to figure out how to make that item that is supposed to be disposable 
will able to be used over and over and over again. And maybe it degrades a little bit over time, but maybe it's better than nothing. And so those are the things that you have to, you have to, to look at. How am I going to reuse this? How am I going to clean it? So some of the main, uh, if you can throw it in, if, if you have a washer that is a, that is a decontaminating washer, it's a sanitizing washer, and you can throw it in a washer, that's pretty effective, okay? Um, we'll go over some of the, you know, the UVC lights, the, the different sprays, the different thing, you know, a lot of different things that can do that. Um, one of the things that we have around us fairly commonly is sunshine. And sunshine is actually a pretty good decontaminant. Uh, most things under the right circumstances, meaning it's not shaded, direct right out in the sun, you know, full, full on direct sunlight uh, for one hour will, will eliminate most contaminants in most things. So that's as a, as a, it's better to throw it in a washer if you can, but if you can't, if you stick it out and it's, it's flat enough to where all surfaces are, are involved, you stick something on the, on the dashboard of your car, things like that will do a fairly decent job at cleaning most surfaces fairly well if it comes down to it, okay? Some smooth surfaces, of course, you can scrub them off with different things, but you, you have to think about that because if you really need it, everybody else really needs it also, and getting it is going to be very difficult. Okay, disposal. How? What do you do with it once it once you take it off? Where are you going to hang it? How are you going to keep it safe so that it's not uh, so it's, it's not hanging around where it's going to be or a risk? Okay, next. Okay, so specifics. We're talking about gloves. So gloves. First of all, you want them to fit. Uh, usually, so these 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 are great gloves, and I, I try a ton of different gloves, but. Uh, most people don't want latex. It will. It, it has a very high rate of allergy uh, uh, development with latex. Um, powder free. You want powder free. The powder stuff will start to to dry out your hands. Okay. Our skin is our is our best defense. Okay. We want to save that as a last resort when we're sanitizing. But if if what we're putting on our skin makes our skin less effective, meaning it's cracky and dry, then you're, you're making your situation worse, not better. So what you don't want to do is just randomly buy a bunch of, of gloves and figure that that's good. Because you've got to make sure that they fit you, because if they're all baggy and they don't fit well, you're not going to wear them. Okay, so they've got to fit you well, so get the right size. Smalls fit me in these, others I wear mediums. It's, it's like, you know, women's clothing. Who knows what the size is? So it's kind of, you've got to try it to see what it's actually going to, what, what, what's going to fit, what feels okay, and, and, and uh, the, the flexibility. You don't want the, the ones that, you know, are for scrubbing dishes if you're doing something that's more, more you know, fine motor skills. You want gloves that feel like it's just your hands, okay? That, that you can do anything with those gloves on that you can do barehanded. Okay. Um, reuse, that just sounds nasty. But the rea truth is truth. Now, fortunately, I, I, I tend to order everything at least a year ahead. So when we got pounded, you know, when, when everything got closed down with COVID and then they say, okay, you can go back to the office now and nobody can get gloves. I had at least a year's supply sitting in my basement because that's just what I do. Um, so, and you go through a ton of, you, you do it right, you're gonna go through a lot of gloves. You'll see as I'm doing the donning and doffing situation that, that you, you want quite a few of them. Now, you can reuse them if you wash them well, depending on the material, and you dry them well. Uh, an, an example, went to, um, Columbia several years ago doing cleft lip and palate surgery and so we're in a hospital and a, a little hospital out in the you know out in the middle of nowhere and just hundreds of people traveled to that hospital and the the hospital itself stripped it of everything there was nothing in that in that hospital that was usable because we were supposed to bring it all ourselves 
And so we brought all our gloves and everything, every material that we needed, uh, our own anesthetics, everything. And I, one day I had a short little break. And so I, I walked outside in the, the back of the hospital and they had clotheslines set up and there were all our surgical gloves. And so they were taking them out of the garbage and they were washing them and they're hanging them out to dry. And my first thought is, oh my hair. And then you start thinking, well, what's their choices? They have, it's that or nothing. So given the choice of that or nothing, okay, I'll wash it and hang it out on the line and let it dry and reuse it if you have to. Disposable is always much better. There's less chance of cross-contamination with disposable, but sometimes disposable just isn't, isn't available. And it also depends on what you're doing. We're not doing surgery, you know. We're, we weren't doing surgery with you who reuse gloves, but the Colombians were because they didn't have, they didn't have the gloves to choose from. It was, it was either our cleaned gloves or bare hands. So in that case, yeah, maybe they have a plan. Okay, storage, major thing with gloves, okay. You get a box of gloves and you open it up because you want to use some because you're cleaning out your drains or whatever and they're really nice to have for that and then six months later you go back and you pull one out and it just crumbles in your fingers okay once you open these they will start to deteriorate hopefully it's just the first few layers and you dig down through the ones that you put on and it tears apart you put on the next one it tears apart and finally you get down to some that will start to to hold up these do not last a long time once you open them up. They do really well when they're still in the box, when they have no light and not a lot of circulating air around them. But you open these up and they will not last long. So don't figure that, I mean, this has a hundred, this will probably last me years and years and, you know, because I only use it when I'm cleaning out my drains and they're, it's not going to last years and years. Okay, so you kind of have to, you have, you have to uh, plan on that. Keeping them in a Ziploc bag in a dark place will also. So if you open this up, take them out of the box, put them in a Ziploc bag, keep them someplace where they're out of the light, and then they, they will hold up well. So, okay, all right, next. Okay, um, eye protection. Okay, so eye protection. Um, you want any anybody that does does anything construction or anything like that you know that just plain glasses don't generally cut it stuff can go underneath and around it and we're also dealing with airflow so it needs to cover all you know it's got to have sides to it this is decent it's not great but look at the, go to the next one that's better a face shield is much more efficient uh, much more effective at at protecting more area. Plus the fact, if I have to reuse this mask, I would really, really like to have it behind the face shield. We didn't ever used to use face shields. We had to, that was a requirement. Um, and so we started using face shields. Now we don't have to use face shields. We still use face shields. You wash those face shields off a few times, you start thinking, I'm gonna wear a face shield. So anyway, all right. So but again, you're, you're, if you have to reuse, You'd be better off find a face shield. If you're going to be in a high risk situation, you're going to be far better off with a face shield than you are with glasses. Okay, next. Okay, sizes. So a micrometer is a millionth of a meter. Okay, so in one meter, you have a thousand millimeters, and then within that millimeter, you have a thousand micrometers. Okay. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter, so a thousand, mi a thousand nanometers will fit in that one micrometer, okay? We're talking really, 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 really tiny. All right, viruses are between 5 and 30 nanometers, which is, so, or 300, 5 and 300. So 300 nanometers is 0.3 micrometers, okay? So just giving you an idea. So as we're looking at some of these numbers, what we're really looking at. All right, a respiratory droplet usually is between five to 10 micrometers in diameter, okay? And can generally carry approximately 6,500 viruses. And, and that's the average size. Some are bigger and some are smaller, but that's kind of the average size of a respiratory droplet, okay? 
Okay, droplet nuclei, that's what we call micro droplets, they're less than five micrometers. That's considered an aerosol. That's the level where you spray it in the air and it'll just float there. It doesn't drop to, it, it may eventually work its way to a surface, but it can just stay there for a fair amount of time, okay? Those are much smaller and tend to hold much fewer viruses, typically closer to five, sometimes less, or 50, sometimes less than that uh, viruses in, in a micro droplet. So it's not that they're safe, but you don't have the mega doses that are in your regular droplets. Your regular droplets are gonna, gravity is gonna catch them, they're gonna, they're gonna fall. How, how quickly that all happens, there's a lot of factors we're gonna get into. All right, so, so uh, an, an aerosol, when I say an aerosol can carry many thousands of micro droplets, that's a whole spray of aerosol, okay? That's not one micro droplet, that's the whole aerosol, aerosolized you know, uh, contamination can carry thousands of micro droplets, so you can still have a lot of viruses carried in those tiny droplets. Okay, and it can stay for hours in the air if the air is stagnant and not moving. So airflow becomes a really, really big deal when you're talking about anything that could be transmitted as an aerosol. Okay, uh, infections can occur with this with with approximately a thousand virus dose is usually what we're looking at, but that varies tremendously based on, if you think back to the HIV versus hepatitis, okay, some it could be significantly less than that and others it could be more. But generally we're looking at, if you get a thousand, a, a dose of a thousand, you've got a reasonable chance if, it's, if it has a high virulence of catching that. Uh, so, much more important is the size of the carrier. Okay. You're, you're not trying to pick individual viruses out. You're trying to stop whatever is carrying it. And so that's, that, that's where you really need to be thinking as you choose your mask or you choose your, your gown or you choose what, you know, what is carrying this, uh, this virus. Okay. All right, respiratory droplet mechanics. So we, we, you, can, you can look it up on YouTube how, how water droplets move. As they spin, they elongate and then they break into smaller pieces that then spin, so, and they also spread out. So in one way, it's like a shotgun effect. The further you are, the more it spreads out. But in another way, it isn't because those BBs are not separating. So you can kind of test it for yourself. You take a take a, a, a paintbrush, okay, and hold a piece of paper at a certain distance and flick it and see what it looks like. And then you hold it a certain little bit further away. And where you're going to see it is the droplet marks are going to get smaller and smaller, and they're going to get more spread out, okay? So the distance from the source becomes very important because that's what determines the, and the velocity, the velocity and the distance and evaporation, especially in our desert, what starts out here is a big glob of water, by the time it gets over here is much smaller, okay? So the effectiveness of your personal protective equipment has to reflect the conditions under which, which it's being used, just like that rope, okay? 550 pounds is okay if I'm gonna be this far off the ground and just kind of laying back, you know, for a nice little relaxing sit down. But if I'm gonna climb a wall and potentially fall, that's not gonna cut it. Same concept with this. Okay, so looking at some numbers. Sneeze, when you sneeze, up to 30,000 droplets and micro droplets going 200 miles an hour are traveling fairly long distances across the room, okay? And they can carry approximately 200 million viruses. One sneeze can carry up to 200 million viruses. Okay, at high, at, at high speeds. All right, a cough, much lower speed, 50 miles an hour, usually around 3,000 droplets. Also, the sneeze is gonna be partially droplets and partially micro droplets. Okay, so some of it can be aerosolized. Uh, speaking, regular speaking is going to, has a pro usually about 200 viruses per minute that are generated in a certain distance. Again, depending on the speaking. Now, 
if you're inflecting, if you're speaking loudly, if you're energetic and you're, you know, you're emotional about it, you're going to project more. It's going to, you're going to, it becomes closer to, to a cough. Okay. Um, laughing is close to a cough. Okay. So you're talking to somebody and you're laughing, you're basically coughing at each other. Okay. Well, you know, we do that. That's okay. We're not going to stop. But unless we're in a life-threatening situation, you have to start thinking about those things. Okay, breathing, about approximately 50 viruses per minute in the soft breathing. Okay, it depends on how long, it depends on how much is aerosolized. And, you know, so, so all of these are things, <sighs> a deep sigh breath, especially if you roll your eyes at the same time, is gonna project a fair amount of, of uh, uh, fluid and a fair amount of viruses. Okay, let's go on. Okay. Uh, spraying. This is our, our daughter Alina. She is she she volunteered for this. Now, and I thought, you know, how many times we picked up? We've got we we were getting more and more grandkids almost on a daily basis. This uh, at this point it seems like. So you pick up a cute little grandkid and you look at them and they sneeze right in your face. Do we say, oh, that is just sweet? Do it again. We say, oh, we we naturally recoil. We, we inherently know that's not good, okay? And, and it isn't, a lot is carried in that, in that sneeze. And so we, we don't really want that. That this is bad. Now this is just water and we didn't actually spray her. So, you know, we, the, the disclaimer, Alina was not injured in this, in this presentation, so. Okay, so that was bad. Okay, yeah. go to the next one. Okay, this is good. She's got eye protection, she's covering her hair, she's got a mask. Okay, so she's gonna get sprayed. It's not gonna be super pleasant unless it was this type of temperature and you wanna do it to cool off. But for the most part, most of that is gonna be stopped because most of those droplets are big enough that they're not going to go through this particular mask. Now that doesn't mean any other mask, okay? This particular mask. Some masks may be the equivalent of that one little tiny cord. Others are the equivalent of the, the bigger rope. Okay, you've got to know your equipment. What is this designed to stop? Okay, all right, so we saw bad. This is good. Now let's go to the next one. Okay, this is, this is better. Okay. Because we are catching the, the, the droplets closer to the source. Okay, the closer you are to the source, the higher percentage of those droplets you're going to collect before they get very far. Okay, so Alina is going to fight, feel far less of the face spray under these conditions than she is if she's wearing the mask. Okay, it's basic fluid dynamics. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is best. So bad, good, better, best. Best is protections both directions. Again, how far you go is going to depend on how concerned you are with this particular contagion. Okay, next. Okay, masks. Um, it, it, it depends on what you're using it for. An N95 captures 95% of 0.1 microns. Now, we saw that the sizes of the viruses are usually 5 to 300 nano, nanometers. And 300 nanometers is 0.3 microns. So the majority, and most of the viruses are on the bigger side of that, not the smaller side. Although some, you get some of them like measles that are truly airborne and all bets are off at that point. They're smaller than what this will filter. So, so filters are, but that's under ideal conditions, which vary. Just curious on what size is COVID? COVID is, let's say, I looked that up. It is about one, uh, about 150 is approximately about 150 nanometers, so 0.15, okay? Uh, was, that's, you know, that's, that's the numbers that I was able to find. I didn't look up the research and verify it. So, you know, take it for what it is. Um, full disclosure, I, I, I didn't do the research myself. All right, so, so you're in the area that that type of mask will take out most of it, but if it's wet, if you've been wearing it for a long time and your breath has now made the inside wet, okay, we all know what, what happens with, okay, you're in a, a, a canvas tent and it's keeping the rain out pretty well until you touch it. 
and you draw that water through and now there's water going through and now what happens it's going to start to leak okay so the how long we've been wearing that mask how what was the humidity of the area is it drying out is it not what's our you know our, our breathing into it all of these are factors that, that come into play how many times has that been reused how many times have you set it on the on the dashboard of your car to clean it off okay all of those are going to decrease these numbers and so again you've got it you, you've got to know your equipment right um, all right uh, the fit both for comfort and for function if it doesn't have some type of moldable metal bridge don't wear it it's not going to work you've got it otherwise every time you breathe you're aerating your eyeballs you've got to have something that's going to seal and it's got to seal it's got to seal fairly well if it's something that's scary enough that you're really going to worry about it to that to that degree so how it fits makes a big difference an air pocket because for those of us who wear masks all day long we know these things you don't wear something that's right up against your face okay it's got to have an air pocket so you can breathe more freely that also gives you some insulation from the mask itself okay also stability and speaking uh, giving a lecture like this when you have to wear a mask and it's moving up and down and all that is really difficult so what you're going to be doing in that mask okay face shields face shields as i said before are very helpful but face shields are not masks nor are they effective as masks so when you see somebody running around with a little face shield like this that's doing very little because it's not absorbent things are going to airflow is going to carry things around them also masks that have valves in them will protect the wearer but not the recipient because it goes out through the valve and is not filtered and then you know as, as, as they're projecting it out so it helps to a degree but it's not as reliable okay let's go to the next okay so just some types of masks this is a medical mask uh, they come in three types uh, one being the cheapest very very minimal protection but some up to three which is pretty good that's designed for surgery uh, let's go to the next one Okay, uh, so this is the KN95, which I call the, this, this is the, uh, this is the counterfeit N95. These are the N95s that were produced and tested in China and then sent here as N95s. The very first time I put one of those on, I thought, this is not an N95. I can breathe through this way too easily. And, and in the testing, they're not. It is not an N95. It's not even close to it. No N95 has ear loops, for one thing. They're, the seal is not good enough with ear loops. So if it has ear loops, it's not an N95. However, this mask is better than our medical masks. It, it does filter better, and it's more comfortable to wear, and, and it does seal better. And I'll show you kind of how we test these. So, so they're not without value. You just have to know what it is that you're using and what you're using it for. So they're good masks for the right, right circumstances. Okay, next one. This is an N95. So this is an N95. You can see the puckering and everything. It's tight. You don't breathe around it. Uh, you have to breathe through it. If you have to wear one of these, you want to breathe slowly. If you start hyperventilating and it's making you feel claustrophobic, you're really not going to be able to breathe with it. You've got to breathe slowly. And then you have to Okay, let's go to the next one. Sorry, I think we're getting, I don't know how long we're supposed to go, but we're about done. Okay, this is the, this is actually a real testing thing. Again, Alina, you know, putting herself out there to uh, demonstrate our tester. And, and it's, it's, it's for that. And what you do is you put something, some type, you know, an, an oil, um, uh, the lemon oil stuff is really nice for that. You know, something citrusy is pretty easy to recognize. And so you put that in in a mixture and you spray a little bit in there and you basically see if you can smell it. So our sense of smell, basically what we're doing is we are chemically analyzing what we breathe in and our brain then interprets it. Okay, we can tell things from the smell and what, what we're doing is we're breathing in either particles or droplets and our, our, um, and, uh, and then our brain processes that and tells us what it is. Okay. So, so that's, that's how we test them, but you can test them fairly easily yourself. Just, you can test it with, this is an aerosolizer. 
or any kind of aerosol that's safe. You know, this isn't an, an, an excuse to sniff a bunch of, you know, Glade uh, aerosol or something like that. But, you know, something that's safe to smell uh, and noticeable, an, an aerosol or a regular spray bottle. You spray it in the air and you just, do I smell it? You see what it's like without the mask, you try it with it. With the mask, you walk through it, you, you, can, you can compare different masks based on your sense of smell. So a quick, easy way of, of seeing what you're, what you're doing. Okay, donning and doffing. Um, this part I'm gonna do as a demonstration because it is just too complicated to try to write out on, but it's, it's significant. So give me just a minute to, oh man, it's gonna be warm. So if you have a thermometer, it's going to be 150 degrees inside. No, actually, these are super great. These are reusable. Uh, we tried the disposable and tried reusing over it. These are light. They're, they're very, uh, very fluid resistant. They're, you can use them hundreds of times. They're just awesome. They are, we've tried many, 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 and too, too many of them. Our, our air conditioning system went out just when we were required to start to wear these things. And the ones that are like wearing a plastic bag are, you know, almost more deadly than any of the viruses. So anyway, so these are really good. That's what this is. The, the BritainInc.com is where we got them from. It's actually a company that, that made other things. And they, with COVID, they started making these. And like I said, we've tried several different uh, sources and these are the best we were able to find. So, okay, got to get my, my Ravenclaw hat on. And the reason I'm putting all this on is because I'm going to have to take all this off. Okay, so all right, so I, you probably can't hear me. So I see this patient or whatever family member that needs help and they're contagious or you know whatever, and I've got my gloves. Let me get my gloves. So the gloves are generally the last thing you put on because they go over the top of the cuffs. Now, if this was sterile and was, you know, then it'd be a little different situation. No rings. Rings come off. Okay, so this ring is non-existent right now. Okay. All right, so I've done everything that I need to do. Now I'm contaminated. And now I've got to take it off. Okay, so how am I going to do that? First of all, I need somebody else to untie me in the back because I'm dirty and I can't do it. If I don't have somebody else, my backup plan is more gloves, okay? Because I, I, I would have to take these off, carefully reach back here, untie it, put on another pair of gloves, and then go from there, okay? So I'm gonna have my lovely assistant <coughs> untie me in the back. Okay. So, hands are up here. They never go below your waist. I'm gonna take this. Work it off, okay. Touching only. Hold on. Okay, so now this is done. I can take this off. Now I need to take the rest of this off. How am I going to take the rest of this off? This is contaminated, so this I can probably do. If I know where it is, I can take this off, okay. And that's nice. Okay. And I'm not really going to set it here. Okay, this is bad. I put it wherever it's going to be clean. Okay. Okay. Now I've got to take my mask off. And how am I going to do that without contaminating my face? So I can't. So I'm going to take my gloves off. So I grab my gloves. I pull it off. So this one without touching your skin. Pull it off. Wrap that inside the other one. Up underneath it. Pull that off. So now it's inside of itself. This is where I was touching. Nothing else was touching. I can touch it there. 
I can throw it away. Now I can put on another pair of gloves. So you go through a lot of gloves. Or I can wash my hands if I, you know, after if I need to. A barrier is more effective than sanitizer. So I'm going to choose to use a barrier. I'm going to put the gloves on. Now these are clean. Okay, I can touch back here, but now this is contaminated potentially. Okay, I'm going to take that off. That gets thrown in the garbage or in whatever we're, you know, we're, if we're reusing or whatever we have to do with it. Now I've got my gloves again. So I'm going to take that off. Take that. My hat. Exactly. I forgot it. So I'm going to have to either put another pair of gloves on and take that off. Okay. Or have somebody else that's going to take it off for me. But here I can probably find it and take it off okay. Again, it depends on whether I can do it and only touch this with gloves on. Okay. So you just the, the process is you have to think about every every step. And so when you're first doing it, you, you take time and you stop and you say, okay, what's dirty, what's clean? What can I touch and where am I going to put it? And how am I going to and and if you mess up, then you wash your hands and you go on from and you go on from there. But you don't just keep going, and now I've contaminated my hair and my skin, and now I have to go decontaminate everything. You know, well, take a shower, that's okay. But, but the idea is you have to pay a lot of attention. Masks, you saw the whole, when you have a mask, the whole idea is that is absorbing all of the contaminants. Don't touch it. If you touch your mask and you're moving it around and you're pulling on it and all of that, you're now contaminating your hands because that mask will hold, will, will hold contaminants. So, okay. Uh, hand washing. Be very careful about the temperature because really hot water will dry your skin. Most of the hand sanitizers are going to dry your skin. And then your natural barrier is now compromised because now you have dry, cracky skin. You're, you're, you're better off just washing your hands and not doing, you know, but even with the, with washing your hands, the soaps that you're using, okay, you want to, so, so using hand sanitizers that either, this one doesn't have alcohol, but is, is, it's kind of slimy, but it's, it's pretty, it's, it's effective. This one is, is very good and very moisturizing. So, so paying attention to the health of your hands. If you're having to do this over and over and over again, you really want to make sure that your hands are kept healthy. So hot water is bad. We want it lukewarm. Hot water is going to draw more of the moisture out and it's going to dry your hands out more. Um, okay, uh, the, 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 the flow of what well, we talked about, uh, about uh, recontamination. So the flow of the water. Okay, you're washing your hands and then you drop them down here and the, the, the contaminated water from here runs back down on your, on your fingers. Those are fine points, but again, it depends on how safe you're trying to be. So paying attention when you wash your hands, where is the water going? And, and what are you touching after that also? And, and always clean, clean it first. If you're going to use a sanitizer, it's got to be clean. If your hands are dirty, the size of the dirt that's caked on your hands is much thicker than the viruses are. They're going to, you, you take that alcohol and you move it around, you look at your hands and it's still just as dirty, it's just moved around a bit, okay? You're not, it, it's going to kill some of it, but it's not reliable, okay? You, if, if a dirty surface is much harder to sanitize than a clean surface, okay? Are there a lot of alcohols, like, I've heard a lot of bad things about sanitizer. Like, is there a lot and, of sanitizers that are toxic, that kind of... Besides those two brands, what do you know? Yeah. The, the reality is it's, yeah, that's one of the big reasons why a barrier is better than sanitizing. Because we're dealing with chemicals and we're dealing with nasty chemicals. And, and I have some major concerns about the long-term use of, of sanitizer. I mean, the, the practice of you take your kids and you lather them up with sanitizer and then where do their hands go? Right in their mouth. That's really concerning, really, really concerning. And so I think that's that's a very important point that, that we need to keep in mind is minimize the use of sanitizing chemicals, but you do that by planning ahead and using effective barriers. 
is you're absolutely right. No, there are none that are, that are really known to be that safe. Now, yes, there are some that, okay, doesn't have alcohol, we think it's safer, who knows? There you have to get into the individual studies and see how well were they done, were they done by the company that's making that, that product, you know, all of these, it's, it's a, it, it's kind of a rabbit hole, but it's, you know, it's, it's what we're stuck with. So how well does hand washing work without sanitizer? Very well. Hand, hand washing is pretty effective. Again, you want to be careful about the, 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 the temperature. Uh, you, you want to make sure you get all surfaces. You want to be very cognizant of your, of your fingernails. Okay. And, and under your fingernails and clean, clean there. You want to clean down, you know, whatever part may be exposed, you work down this way. And then, then you go back and do your hands again, so that so that you're not using your clean hand to wash your dirty elbow. Okay, so that the hands are the last thing cleaned again. They're the first thing cleaned and the last thing cleaned. So you come around. So you're using clean hands. You don't want to use dirty hands to clean, to to wash your semi-dirty elbow either. So start with your hands, work your way down from there, and then in with your hands. So. But that's uh, washing is going to be more effective in most cases, so, okay. and, and probably safer over the long run. So, okay, in home isolation. So here we're into a situation. Okay, somebody in the family is sick, and this is really contagious, and we can't take them to the hospital because they're already full of you know fifty thousand people there, and I sure don't want to go there. And so, how are we going to now manage this situation? Okay. We've been trying to avoid it. It didn't work to some degree. Somebody's got it and we have to now deal with it. Okay. So an isolation room is, is one way to start. If you have a trailer or something like that and it's not 150 degrees in it, that can be a fairly good isolation room. Um, otherwise, you've got to pick a place in, in your house. Now what, what, what we have as just in case is one of our basement hallways has a bedroom and, a, and another bedroom and a bathroom. And there's a long narrow hallway that goes to that. We bought a door that fits not exactly, but pretty close into that area. So I could take that door that's just in our storage room and I bring that up and I set it up and I call conceal around it and the base. And that's at least a decent barrier. It's at least something, okay? But you also have to pay a lot of attention to where the airflow is. We'll get into that a little bit. PPE management. Okay, I'm going to have to go into this area, and so I'm going to have to I'm going to have to gown up and get ready. What am I going to do with it when I come out? How am I going to open the door? How am I going to close the door? You're going to have to have something on the other side of the door that you can change there, so that you now have something clean to wear back out. But it's only sort of clean because it's been in that area. You can see there's a lot. It's a it. It's the English term sticky wicket or something like that. It's a, it's, it's a can of worms, but we have brains. We can think it out. We just have to do that. We have to think, where am I touching? Where is the, and a huge thing is where the airflow is coming from. So some way of creating a, of creating a barrier, some way of managing your personal protective equipment. So you're not standing there at the door saying, now what do I do? Is somebody going to now have to come down and they're going to have to gown up just to open the door and let me out? And then what am I going to do? You know, so you have to plan that. If you have another space that you can take this out, you can take, you can throw it in the laundry or whatever you, but you have to, you have to plan that ahead. Everything, I'm going to take it off here. I'm going to throw it into this bin. I'm going to take that bin and throw it into the, the laundry and I'm going to wash it. And, you know, you, you have a plan put together how you're going to deal with it. Airflow is huge. You've got a, especially any kind of, of semi airborne or airborne virus and the air conditioning comes on and it sucks the air from your, your isolation room and blows it through the house. And that's a bad thing. You, not good. Okay, so where are your air intakes? If you have any air intakes in the area of your isolation area, you're gonna have to block them off. You cannot have air, air intakes coming from that from that area. Okay. Now, positive pressure and negative pressure rooms. Positive pressure is to to protect that person. So let's say 
grandma's staying at our house and she's highly susceptible and the rest of us have it and we're trying to protect her, we are going to want to create a positive pressure room, which means when I open that door, I feel the air blowing towards me, okay? Much more likely, we have one person that's really sick and we want to isolate them, we're gonna to wanna to create a negative pressure room, okay? A negative pressure room means I open that door and I've gotta pull on it a little bit because the air is being sucked into that area, okay? So, so that contains it. Negative pressure contains it, positive pressure protects. Okay. So if the sick one is in there, you want to contain it. If the healthy one is in there, you want to protect it. Okay. So now, how do you create that? So, so uh, fans and filters are your, your uh, fans are your main uh, way of creating a, a negative pressure room. So let me just go through that. Okay. So. What this is, if you can see it, this is the room to my operator. This is this is my operatory. Okay, so an inline fan is the most effective because you want to take you want to, to pull air from that room and blow it out an otherwise sealed window. If you have just a box fan, it depends on how strong that is because you get a little bit of wind against a box fan and the wind will be more powerful than the fan is. Now what you're looking for is, is um, uh, the, um, let's see, back up the slide. The, yes, uh, the circulations per minute, okay, the cubic feet per minute. So how quickly you can circulate. So the CFM, uh, cubic feet per minute. Most fans will tell you that. They'll tell you this, is, this blows this much air. And so you look at the size of your room, and ideally what you want to do is be able to fully recirculate that. Now you have to have some place that the air is coming in through, so usually you're going to put a vent in that door that's going in, put some kind of a vent in it. You are going to cover that if you're not creating a negative pressure. If you're running a negative pressure, you take that off and let the airflow go in. And, and you're drawing it out using your, using your inline fan. The inline fan works best because it's not, or if it has valves like our, our, our uh, dryers, okay? So, that, so you're blowing the air out but not letting the wind blow back in. You want to circulate the air in that area about once, about, about 12 times an hour is ideal. At least five times, better 12 times an hour. And so you just basically do the, do the math. Um, my fans will circulate, because it's a surgical room, uh, and it's quiet, you don't even realize it's hardly there, it creates a nice, feels like a nice gentle breeze, it's really actually pretty pleasant. And, but yet it will circulate the air in our operatory every two minutes, so 30 times an hour, which is pretty phenomenal. But so anything that's airborne just goes out there and is blown out Onto the, onto the roof, okay. Into um, the sunshine. Into the sunshine, exactly. Um, you, you can use filters, the HEPA filters. Again, you've got to research those out. Some of them are pretty good and some aren't so good. You've got to see what, what the, the actual data on those particular filters are. Um, so they're better than nothing. But if you can blow the air out and circulate it around, that's going to be more effective than filtering something and blowing it back into the same room, okay? So, so, so blowing out is better than filtering back in, okay? Okay, next. All right, so fun part, products and marketing. Oh, let, the, let the games begin because this, there is so much stuff out there that's marketed to do so many things. Part of the issue is if you look at, is it, is this something that is overseen by the EPA or the FDA, okay? The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, their concern is environmental safety, okay? Not efficacy. They do not guarantee and they don't study, they don't oversee, they don't really do anything with that as long as there's one study that shows that it actually can 
Okay, that's a huge difference. FDA looks at every little application. Every time you change the smallest little thing, you have to redo the study. So, so we'll kind of we'll, we'll see what I mean with this. UVC lights. UVC lights are now UVB lights and UVA lights are not effective. Uh, some will say, well, these are safer. They're really not. And but they, the, the data is all from UVC lights. All the real major data is on the UVC lights. Now, UVC is kind of dangerous. That's, you know, we, we get sunburn. It'll, it'll burn us. It'll damage our eyes. It's, it's kind of nasty stuff, which is why it works really well. UVC lights have been used to clean municipal water before it goes back into a source for decades. And it's, it's, it's very, very, very well studied. Tons of research on this. Um, it, it works, but in those parameters, when you take that and try and, and extrapolate that to air, it becomes a much different situation. So in trying to research UVC, I went back through the rabbit hole of study to then study opinion, opinion papers that then talk about studies and got back to some of the original research looking at it. And there were, there were three different ones and they all had kind of a very similar end, uh, end result. One, it's very effective. However, it requires, it depends on how strong it is which is, in this case is watts. How many watts is it? Okay. And the duration, how long is the, is the exposure and what's the distance from that? So there, there are three pieces of that equation. Almost never are you going to find all three of those pieces of the equation on a product that's being sold. It's not there. Okay. And so, but that research showed that if you, uh, let's see, if you use, uh, what was it, um, 30 watts for 30 minutes will pretty well sanitize one, one uh, meter, okay. one cubic meter. So, so if, you're, if you pick up a four watt wand of UVC light and you're going to sanitize this table, how long are you going to, how long is that going to take you to do it? So you go, good, okay. No, it's, it, it, if, it's, if it's nearly touching, so you're as close as you can get to something, you have to be in that location for about a second. Okay, so not a long time, but when you're figuring, okay, how, with no obstruction. So some of these things, you, there's somewhere, okay, you take this little wand, you turn it on, you stick it in your purse, and it's going to clean everything in your purse. And no, because the light won't get to everything in your purse. Okay, so you have to look at, is it under direct exposure? So how powerful is it? How far is it? Are you trying to do a room with it? Or are you just trying to do a surface? Some of them, so say for example, you take your cell phone, you put it in and it closes and it's really close and you have it in there for 10 minutes or something, that's probably gonna do a pretty good job, okay? But you, you still have to look at what's, what's the wattage. So there's, there's a whole formula that goes, that goes along with that. All right, um, go to the next one. So for example, this, it's kind of hard to tell, but this, so this is a chamber that we created and it's, it's mirrored on the inside, so you, you bounce the UVC rays all around. The UVC that we use is 90 watts. It's designed, it's not designed, it's marketed to clean a room. The size of, you know, a typical bedroom or an operatory or, you know, an exam room. It's not going to do that. I mean, 30 minutes for one square meter and I'm doing an entire room. I'm going to have that thing going all day, plus that doesn't take into account the huge idea of now, it's not one meter away, it's exponential. The distance changes it exponentially, okay? So, so I'm using something that's designed, I keep saying designed, that is marketed to clean a room, but I'm using it to clean something about a half a meter in half a cubic meter, okay? And if you figure out the math, it should clean that 
in under a minute. We zap it for 10 minutes just because we feel better about it. And you open it up and it smells like you just took that out of the sun. I mean, it, you can tell it, it was doing something. And these have been shown to be fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, efficacious, but is it shaded? That's where the mirrors come in, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's less intense if it's, if it's reflected, but anybody that's, that spends any time in, you know, the water, you hold one of these reflective things, you're gonna get sunburn from it. It does reflect, so, so there is some so efficacy to what it. do you sanitize in there? Uh, face shields, mostly. The rest is reusable now. When we couldn't reuse them, we'd stick stuff in there, you know, put the other things in as well. But things like, we, we wash them off, but these have little places that no matter how hard we wash them, we could miss. And so we, we and this is a, this is, this is uh, a, a non-sterile use. If it's, if it's sterile, then we pretty much have to use disposable. But disposable usually in these types of situations is not, um, is, isn't available, it just isn't there. So you use what you can. Um, next one. Okay, uh, silver, silver has been shown to be very, very effective. However, all of the studies that, that go back very far, I, I looked through, I, mean, I probably looked through 10 or 15 different studies with, with silver, and they all measure everything in hours, okay, or at least the very least is a half hour. So the exposure time to silver is pretty much a minimum of a half hour if you're really expecting it to be effective. Um, the looking at, at water filters, they looked primarily at the ceramic. The ceramic is pretty good at, at filtering it out. With silver on that ceramic, it made no difference until you got up to around 60 or around 6,000 gallons or something. So it would make it last a little bit longer potentially, but not, most of the studies don't actually look at the silver in that use. And so generally the concern, and I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm just saying there's not a lot of real data of if you're taking a few seconds for this water to pass across that silver, is it really doing anything? Okay, there's not much data that, that, there's a lot of data saying it probably doesn't. There's not a lot of data saying that it does. Who knows? But the main research done is measured in hours, not in minutes, and definitely not in seconds. So why, how would you do any of that? How would you go about silver film material? Yeah, so, so that's a big can of worms. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, there's very little silver actually in them. They're just silver colored. They're actually, it's, it's actually amalgam. Uh, which is a bunch of different metals mixed in with, with mercury, which that's a, that's a great thing. So, okay, um, because you asked, and I'm gonna do the, a very, very, very short thing on, on that. Um, it's nasty stuff, but taking it out can be even nastier because your, your mercury levels spike with the process of trying to remove it. Now you can do all kinds of things to try to minimize that. The next question is, what are you gonna put back in there? So you're gonna put in a really nice looking uh, tooth colored composite, which happens to be large, made out of Biz GMA, which tends to, which has the same uh, wrap right now as do plastic water bottles left out in the sun, okay? So there's some concern and a fair amount of evidence that some of these materials used in some of the replacement materials could have some hormonal effects. And so, you know, there could be a whole lot more spoken about that. We could, you know, I could, I could spend another way, way too long going through what is actual data and what is really shown. Yes, it's nasty stuff. Is there anything better? that's gonna last longer and not, not leach and not leak and all of that. Um, eh, that's, it, it, it depends on your definitions and it depends on what you're looking at. And you know, it'd be really nice to come up with something that didn't have mercury in it and doesn't have any of the, you know, this GMA and any of these other things in it. Uh, gold, 
Gold is great. Put gold in there. Yeah, yeah. And actually, actually, the next lecture I'm doing is dental prep, and we're going to talk about some of those some of those things because we create a lot of problems with what we do with them. But it's the choice we have, and so we have to make a, we have to make decisions. So, all right, um, cleaning. So, uh, so hydrochloric acid. Um, hydrochloric acid is it's it's what your your pool chlorinator makes except that these you can change the concentration of it and so basically you're creating chlorinated water that is less corrosive and is is safer you still don't really want to drink it but you know you get it squirted on you it's not it doesn't burn it you know it's not the same as as um is sodium hypochlorate as, as bleach. So it's, you know, you can you can clean surfaces with it. We can't clean our surfaces with, with bleach. It'll tear it up. We can't clean our instruments in bleach. It will corrode them in, in no matter what they are. The, the, the hypochloric acid you can use much, much easier, but it's also very effective. A ton of research has been done on these, um, but some of it is sponsored by the companies that make it. Most of it is not. Um, because there are different companies you can get it from. Okay, let's go to the next one and it'll cover just a little bit. This is, okay, this is a little hypochloric acid generator. Uh, so you can use this to, you know, wherever you would use a bleach solution. Um, it takes a little tiny bit of salt, I think two, gra two grams of salt and a little bit of vinegar. So a little bit goes a long way and you can do thousands of gallons. With, with this of, of cleaning cleaning solution. Be very careful with them. They're designed to drop, and if you drop it, unless you know how to get in there and solder the pieces back together, it's not gonna work. And they're about two hundred dollars. So they're not they're not cheap. But they are they're they're as effective. We this is what we use in our office now because there's a ton of information showing that this is as effective or more effective than the really harsh chemicals that we you know you spray in the room and you gotta clean it. Ugh, you, come out and you're wheezing and hacking and you think that just can't be good. You know, it's safe for the next patient, but it wasn't safe for me being in there with it. You know, <laughs> so we use some nasty chemicals to, to accomplish these things. And so this is, this is very effective for the safety, for the safety level. So uh, hypochloric acid. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, cleaning solutions, bleach, Lysol, all these different kinds of things. Obviously, they're all different. You've got to do your research on each one individual. Uh, oils and remedies, I put those up there because they, 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 they work, they have their things. I do not know much about that. That's not my area. And so I would leave that to, you know, to those of you who are more knowledgeable about that or how those are and disinfecting and cleaning. I know there's some things there, not my area to present. But also, I don't ignore those things. There, 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 there are a lot of things out there that work. You just have to know what does work mean. What's the what's what's the the concentration that you need? What's the duration that it has to has to, to sit there? Okay, and and how powerful you know? Well, that's the concentration. You know, how how long does it need to be there? How how close does it need to be? Usually, with surface contamination, it's right up against it. Um, Things like fabrics, that's a whole different ballgame because you don't have a smooth surface. You've got places for it to hide. Okay. We are actually almost done. Sorry. Okay. Uh, designer bugs. I threw this in here just, okay. Is bioterrorism a potential? Absolutely. I think it is. Okay. Um, how likely? Who knows? How bad are they going to be? Who knows? But it's pretty easy to conceive that there could be quite a bit of that. There's, there's a fair amount of potential. So what's the most likely? If somebody's going to create a designer bug, what is it likely going to look like? Because if we know what it's going to look like, we're going to be more prepared to deal with it. So first of all, is it likely going, how is it likely going to travel? Okay. Is it going to travel in the air? Fairly effective. You can throw a bunch of it out and put it, you know, or in a, in a ventilation system or maybe on the wind that would take it everywhere. You know, you'd have to cover a huge area. Your virulence would have to be off the charts to be able to get a lot done with, with that, but it could work. Yeah, so an, an, anthrax, we see the, the whole situation with anthrax, that's not, you're not flying over in an airplane tossing a, you know, an anthrax bomb. 
you're you're opening something and it's right there, and so you're breathing it you're breathing it in. Okay, and that's a that so that you're going to treat with an antibiotic. And anthrax, you're going to take Cipro. Cipro is the is the antibiotic that is the most effective for for anthrax. So so error is a possibility, but it's tricky. You know, not that they can't do it, but maybe water. Water's a great one. Because water, you can contaminate one source and it goes a long way. You look at what's the effects of cholera and things like that in an area. Okay, you can cover a big area. Here, we're pretty, we're in good shape. We're, we're fortunate because we get our water out of the ground and it's self-contained. But a lot of the country, a lot of the world is surface water. You contaminate a surface water source, people have to drink. They're gonna drink. And so that's a very likely uh, uh, transmission. So pay attention to what are the, what are the, the bugs that can be, can be uh, transmitted in water. Food, that'd be really difficult to do. I mean, so many varieties. It's possible you can get stuff from food, but how to actually, would that be very effective if you were doing a designer book? Probably not. Animals, probably not. People, yeah, that works, but it's very slow. Okay, I'm gonna start with one person. Well, what's your R naught? It comes down to that. Is this an R naught of two? It's gonna be a slow process. Okay, if this is an R naught of 100, that may go like wildfire. Much more likely, you get it started with water, and then you continue it on with people. Okay. So you look at where is the likely going to come from, and how are we going to protect ourselves from that? Okay. You're back to how do you decontaminate your water? How do you protect your water source would be the number one thing. Protect your sources. Okay. Uh, is it a virus or a bacteria? Uh, so the biggest, first of all, viruses, there's a lot more to choose from. Uh, viruses are much smaller, so you have they, they travel a little bit, uh, a little bit easier, although not completely. The biggest difference is if you you can make a vaccine for a virus, you can't make a vaccine for a bacteria. So if you're the one that is going to be spreading it out there, and the wind is blowing back towards you, you toss it out in the air, and it's blowing the wrong direction, and you breathe some of it in, are you going to go home with the same disease? Okay. That's where vaccination becomes a value in protecting yourself from whatever desi designer bug. So viruses allow that much more than a bacteria will. Uh, early or late attack. So an, an early attack. Anytime now in modern warfare, when they're gonna go into an area, they wanna soften it up first. You send in your bombers, you try and get a, take care of as many people before. And, I'm talking like I know something here. I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 I'm not a military person, but the idea, that's why it's a question mark there, okay? So you, if you send that in early, something your people don't get hurt and the people that you're going after do, and then you send your people in at that point. Is your bug going to be something that is going to wipe out the big area right away, or is it something that you want it to take time? It depends on the goals. So again, you're looking at what are, what, what are the goals with it? Who knows? Um, so in my mind, water is a very high potential and then spread by, by people after. Uh, I just threw this in, this had nothing to do with that, but just information. Washington County Healthcare Coalition, I put that in there because otherwise I'd forget about it. That is, so the, the health department has spent many, many years. I've been on the, this healthcare coalition, I don't know, six or seven, maybe eight years. I don't know, it's been there for quite a long time. And what, it's, what it is, is that they've, they've gotten together a, a group of healthcare professionals that, that form a network to distribute uh, antidotes and things like that in a fairly timely manner. It couldn't be used for COVID because it was the vaccine is very temperamental and very, you have to have very specific parameters and it just wasn't something that could be used for that. But for example, anthrax or any, you know, if it's a bacteria that we can, a certain antibiotic, it is set up so that if they can get that, those materials in enough doses, then 
all of those that are part of the, the correlation would go to the coalition, go to the, um, it's the fairgrounds, and we, we're, we've signed up for a certain amount. I cover my, um, my office complex and Diamond Valley. I would go and pick up all of this and then we come back and we then distribute it to the areas. And so it's a, it's a quick way of, of distributing materials if they have it available. And so they really have put a lot of thought into it. They, they do dry runs every so often and all that stuff. And so it really is that they're, they're, they have been very active at trying to do what they can in being prepared. They also have stockpiled a fair amount of, of uh, stuff that they can can distribute to help as far as personal protective equipment and things like that. So they have been quite uh, quite helpful with that. Okay, and that's it. Uh, sorry, it was long winded, but that's what it was. Any any questions? I was wondering if you had any recommended websites because I know you worked with all that research stuff, but I'm wondering like how fast they can come up with that research. If there's any reliable websites that you recommend. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the research that, you're, that I'm talking about there is more in things like there's this product and they're saying that it does this and how do I know if it really does that and do I really want to bet my life on it if this is really something and so what research was really done and, and for there you go to the, to the library and basically you put it in Google and then you, you it will take you to the, the different, you know, Medline, and there, there are several different search engines specifically for studies. Uh, they don't have to be medical. You can put in, so like um, I put in, um, uh, oh, what was it, uh, silver, um, effectiveness of silver at killing bacteria. And then several come up, and then as you usually you're going to get some opinion pages, papers to start with. And then you go to their to their references, and and usually they'll tell you in the reference this was these are the papers that we got our information from, because it's an opinion paper, it's not a study paper. And so then you follow that back and you start looking those. You know, you have a page or two of those, and you start going through those, and you look them up and say, is this a, a real study or is this just another opinion paper? What was their study outline? And so basically, you're just you're 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 taking it. Uh, step by step from whatever you can get to easily and then you follow their path back because if it's if it's a decent paper it's going to have some references of where they got their information from. So so back to what I kind of interpret as the real question here. How do we get information when there's no there hasn't been any time for any real studies? Okay. That's tough. And because emotion is involved. The my opinion and this is a biased opinion, but my opinion is go as close to the source as you can get. So again, if you wanna know about what's happening in the hospital, what are they really seeing? Are these really COVID patients? Are these patients from all kinds of other things that somebody is just telling them to say that it's COVID patients or whatever? Are there, how many patients are there really? It says here in this whatever website, that there are 50 patients in, in the hospital. Are there really 50 patients in the hospital? Okay. Find somebody that works in the ICU. They'll be able to tell you. And they'll be able to tell you what they're, what they're you know, for the most part, what they're there for. Um, you can go, the, the health department really is a good source. They're, they're, they're people from here. They are dedicated. They work, they, they work day in and day out at protecting our community. And they're going to be straightforward with you on what the what the circumstances are as best they know. Now you have to listen for extrapolation. Okay, they're saying, well, what we're seeing is this, but we think it could be this. Okay, okay, well, yeah, that's nice to know, but what are you actually seeing? Okay, so you want to go back to what is, what's what's their firsthand information, and 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 when they say, you know, this is what we are seeing. Okay, what is we? Are you talking about here? In St. George, or you're talking Washington County, so you have to be very specific about what you know. We, they, they say this. We say this. I heard this. You've got to, you've got to define your terms. But, but if you go locally, you're more likely going to get straightforward information, and and talk to a couple of people. 
you're less likely going to get things that are politically charged, things that are emotionally charged, things that are fear driven. I just know the news screens a lot of chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. No <laughs> question. We all saw right that. Now. We all saw that. That's why I say R naught. You look, okay, what's the R naught? What, what are these numbers? What are they talking about? Are they talking about the R naught for Italy? Are they talking about the, the R naught for St. George, Utah? Those are two very, very different numbers. Okay. So, but so you, you have you have to do the work to get enough information to really be able to to, to distill out what it what it really means. So I know that's you know, yeah, but that that's that's the reality. The but don't just take everything we hear and say, oh my gosh, they said this on you know whatever you know news channel, radio channel, magazine, whatever. What areas are they talking about, and what are the conditions that they're describing? So, mm -hmm. and the the information, I don't mean maybe the religious type of media, it, you sometimes have to go off of what you're inspired or what your what your gut feeling is on some type of information. You can't get a source. Sometimes you have to take a higher power and you draw what your gut feeling is. Okay, so my bias is I agree with half of what you said. Okay. My bias is I absolutely believe in a higher being. And I absolutely believe that that higher being cares about us and will communicate with us. And, you know, we all have experiences. Absolutely, I agree with that. That, that if, if you feel inspired that something is the right thing to do, absolutely, I agree completely with that. The part that I don't agree with is the gut feeling. Because gut feeling is emotion. And if you look into to psychology research, okay, we our decision process is hugely emotional and a tiny little bit of rational thinking. Okay? We like to think it's the other way around. No, I study this out in my mind. No, you study it out in your gut, and then you just you then you lead your mind along to find the results that your gut tells you is what you want to hear. And so, so inspiration, absolutely. Gut feeling, that's emotion that is tremendously unreliable and will actually make you misinterpret the facts that are coming to you. You'll ignore the things that you should listen to and you'll listen to the things that you should ignore because you're listening to your gut. So, my opinion. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. I hope you've, it's been. Thank you very much.